Before we begin, I want to say, I did not feel up to recording this video, man. I was tired, grumpy, and just in an overall bad spot. But after a while of staring at my ceiling, I realized, this, this is the real test of faith. I needed to work through this in spite of my headspace. Otherwise, I'll just never get anything done. So, if this video feels offbeat, I apologize. But know that I'd rather keep to my schedule than break my promise to you all and myself. So with that out of the way, let's see where we stand on the old list. With our arrival at the Falling Brick, we've caught up to where I was before I started this series. Woo! This exercise has two parts. The fall and the impact. While the fall will take a while to do, it's mostly just an exercise in timing, bouncing off of what we've already learned. The impact, however, will be a whole nother monster, so I'll save the science intro for when we reach that point. With that in mind, let's learn to animate the falling brick. So I've got two different files open here. The first is my initial take, so let's see what we're working with here. I am stuck with my cursor being like this. Oh, well, it makes it easier for you guys to see. I was trying to figure out why exactly a brick would just randomly fall off of a shelf. And you can have something pushing it, and you can have the shelf falling. I decided that it was kind of precariously placed, so it was going to have this little teetering motion and then fall and break. And the break actually ended up being pretty difficult to do to make that pretty believable. You know, a brick breaking has all of these little parts and dust particles that kind of fly around. And the big part is, of course, this teetering effect that we that I wanted to make. So the idea I was going for is I wanted to use this as a chance to practice ease in and ease out in a new believable situation. The goal is that the brick starts in a neutral position. There we go starts in a neutral position, it builds up speed as it slowly leans off of the shelf and then slows down as it reaches the pinnacle. Then it builds up speed and when it returns back to the neutral position, it's actually going its fastest and then slows down when it makes its way towards the back. Slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, back and forth until eventually it reaches its tipping point and slides off. In your head, you can imagine something teetering in real time. And to us, it's not really that long. But in terms of frames, I mean, that couple of seconds is 24 times however many seconds it takes. If it's five seconds, you know, you're looking at upwards of 120 something individual frames you have to draw to give that same slow teetering experience. So here at eight frames per second, that slow teetering feels a little bit right but the distance the fall travels was made with 24 frames per second in mind. So then if we go to that, the fall is nice, but the teetering just feels way too jarring. So this time with various timing charts. So let's first watch it happen and then we'll do a breakdown. Maybe I should avoid it recording until I actually finish breakfast. Maybe that's why I feel so skeevy. It seems intelligent. So you'll notice the major difference here is of course the addition of my timing charts at the top. If you're going to have <clears throat> an object teetering, you need to justify it by having it be at a point where it's naturally going to start moving. I can't have the brick be at a stationary position and then suddenly lift off. It has to already be slightly askew so that way it justifies its motion randomly starting. Then it leans, builds up speed, but it doesn't get to lean far enough so it slows down. Then on the next timing chart, again, it builds up speed making its way back towards the direction that it came from. Once it's at this halfway point and then it slows down as it goes past the threshold towards the other side. Then builds up speed again. And then it goes back to forward, middle, back, middle, forward, and then ideally it would fall. What I realized that I made a mistake on, it builds up speed and it goes forward. That makes sense. Slow, fast, slow. But when it goes back, the ease in, ease out arc has to cover the whole transition back not just halfway. If I ease in and then ease out at halfway, then start another ease in and ease out at halfway, the brick does this fast slow, fast slow, fast slow, fast slow. And that's not what we want at all. It's gonna be slow starting, fast when it gets the whole distance, and then slow again when it gets to the other side. 
The second thing that I realized was that I was really struggling just to draw rectangles. So on the first half, you'll notice all the little you know, sketch marks. You can see it's sort of disforming and the brick is a little wide here and then it gets a little thinner as I try to get a judgment for the width of it every time I'm redrawing it. So I thought, okay, well, what if I instead just use the shape tool and I figured, oh, that would just make sense. And then I'll just, if I highlight it, can I highlight this? Great. I can grab this little dot here in the center. This is the center point dot and I can actually move it. So that way the object rotates on that point instead of rotating on the center. So I thought, oh, I'll just keep moving the rotation dot to the bottom center of the brick and then just rotate it on an axis. I know I have to keep redrawing things. The only downside to that was that it creates this, uh, in your head, take a plank of wood, right? And put it onto a cylinder and put two people standing on either side. Yes, there's going to be that seesaw motion, but there's also going to be this sliding rolling back and forth, like a, like a boat rocking in the ocean of the seesaw, because there's nothing holding that cylinder that the board is bouncing on in place. And if you notice really closely, you can actually see this brick doing that. As the brick makes its way down, it sort of shoots forward. And of course, because you can see the tip, just the tip, pop out, you can tell that it's obviously not rotating perfectly right on that axis. I think I'm definitely going to stick with hand drawing the brick because I found that to be particularly successful. Now, how do I want to start this? Oh, I definitely want to make my layers for my shelf and for my brick and for my timing chart. Now we remember to make our actual shelf using the line tool. So that way it's a nice solid object. Don't want to have a repeat of last time. So when last I did this exercise, I first planned out exactly how many teeters I was going to have. So let's do just that. That is a sad, sad brick. Maybe if I switch the ankle up on the way that I have my pad? Great, that only took 20 tries. Now I just have to do that 40 bajillion more times. Wonderful. This is my neutral position for the brick, right? It's just on enough of a slant, so that way it's believable that it would start teetering in one direction. And I'm following this mental arc that I'm making for myself, so I can keep track of the corners to keep the shape of the brick. And the same is true over here. Okay, so I fudged it a little bit, but you get the gist of it. So it'll be 11 frame difference, no movement, building up speed, slow down, no movement. Now I'm going to build up speed, go back in the other direction, so I'm obviously going to have this frame. But I am not going to copy the frame, I'm going to copy the vectors within in case I want to make any adjustments to it for later reasons. Now we go in the other direction. And it looks like with this distance, if I take that as a measure marker and bring it... That brings me right to the ground. Now, we can tell that we have equal distances here between the neutral brick and the right leaning and the left leaning. But on the other side, it is much greater. So now I need to go back and fix my neutral one to match. That way, when I start making my halves, I don't screw myself up and actually end up drawing a bajillion times in the same spot. And now we can tell that this line is longer than this line. So this is going to have to be brought up. And then we're going to copy that. Put that there. Now this one also needs to be adjusted. And you just keep going back and forth and making sure that everything makes sense before you get started. That's why we want to make all of these keyframes beforehand. So that way all of the in-betweens, we don't end up messing ourselves up. This is a little long. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, that is obviously an egregious size difference. <sighs> Man, drawing is hard. Mm. That's, that's nice. That's believable. I can work with that. So we have neutral, seesaw to the right, neutral. Now we have to go back. Let's see if I can get this one right the first time. What a nice change of pace that would be. Jesus, drawing a horizontal line is the worst. It's like no right way to get my wrist. All 
All right, so this is our little brick friend at the leftmost point, and we have all of the keyframe positions now. I can just copy them to wherever they need to go. So how many teeters do I want? There's going to be two on either side. So we start off, we have one to the right, one to the left. Two to the right. Two to the left. And then one more to the right where it's going to fall off. Now, let's space all of these out. So when I did my second take on this, I had it be 11 frames for the first teeter to the right and 11 for the first teeter all the way to the left. So it ended up looking weird. So we'll do 11 and then 22, 22, 22, 22, 11, great. 22 frames from that is gonna bring us to 33. Oh, now suddenly you don't wanna copy? What? You had no problem dragging this distance, but suddenly this is too much for you? You copied this one frame for 11 frames. Now when I want you to take the next frame over and drag it twice the distance, that's suddenly too much to ask? And what's this nonsense here with, oh, you instead you decided to take the frame you dragged and bring it and just fill in the gap and then make uh, that? Like, what setting was designed? How am I supposed to keep track of that? Look, see? I dragged that over, and you took this last frame and made a fuck ton of copies of it. You had no problem doing that. Just keep doing that. If that's what you want to do, then do it, but do it every time. So I start with this frame. I click the next one. I bet if I drag this, it'll do that gap thing. Yep. I'll bet that instead, if I grab this frame, and if I'm pulling it, it'll stretch out this frame as much as I want it to. What what happened? What did I do? I had smacked the keyboard. Keep no control Z me. What are you doing? No, why is why is control Z not why are you not going back? Where is everything? Where are my bricks? What the fuck? What did I do? Did I control Z my bricks out of existence? No, because if I had kept going back, then these wouldn't be separated. They'd just be in a big clump over here to the left. What the fuck? What happened? Okay, no, I went back and rewatched the recording. They just disappeared. <laughs> you cheeky little shit! There you are! What are you doing? Why did you get- I didn't let you out of the cage! Oh, it's so dangerous out here! No, this is the real world! This is the scary place! You shouldn't be there! Now I have a copy of that somewhere else on a different layer. Oh god, okay, uh, pr I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go fix this, question mark? I know what happened. I know what happened. I flip-flopped it. When I face-smacked my keyboard, I did a horizontal mirror, and it just put this right there on the other side. That's why it's leaning towards the left now. Where's the button? All right, I'm starting over. Oh, I auto-saved at one point. Unfortunately, my auto-save did not save me this time. What a butt. Okay, so I totally wasn't able to figure out how it was that I flipped my entire animation, or at least parts of it, horizontally. So I sent in a help ticket to Toon Boom. Ticket to Toon Boom. Ticket taka ticket taka. Ticket to Toon Boom. And hopefully they'll be able to provide some insight into what had happened there. However, in the meantime, I wanted to figure out how I could better control the timeline so that way I could avoid that happening in the future. And mad props go to the part-time professor, who is definitely going to be this video's honorable mention, because she taught me about keyboard shortcuts. Oh, I've got these buttons on my mouse. Ah, you know what? I should make one of those blank frame and one of those extend. I don't think I'm ever really gonna need the decrease. <laughs> oh, and if I hold it, it just keeps going. Oh, this is just getting better and better. So now I've caught up to where I was before. I know that I want this first one to go to frame 11. Then this next one, we wanted it to be twice as many frames, 22 frames. 
And then we're gonna do 22 for all the rest of the arcs because they teeter the full distance from right to left or from left to right. No, that is not true. And here's why. Each of my keyframes covers half of an arc. This first keyframe is my neutral position, and the second one is the full distance to the right. But the third one is only back to this halfway point because the fourth brings me all the way to the left. Next keyframe is halfway to the right. So each of these is still going to be 11 frames. From this point, these first two frames ease in, and then ease out. Now these frames ease in to fastest point, and then ease out before it gets to the other side. See how we have a full ease in to ease out in these 11 frames, but that next ease in ease out takes the 22 frames. And the reason that I chose 11 is because 11 just seems to be a really nice number of frames for my arcs. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And now our timing charts, which we're going to do on the timing chart layer. Now, we do a full ease in, ease out cycle for this first one. Damn, that's ugly. I'm actually going to do the little measurement bounces on the side and in different colors. So that way, visually, we can keep track of all this. Boom. Now let's make that. Starting from the beginning, frame six is my wonderful halfway point. So remember how I was talking about those arcs? You know, this creates this arc. This makes one here, here, and here. Well, we can already tell something's wonky because these don't make a nice circle. And I think that means that this one, that this needs to extend out. So what we can do is because we know that this brick is going to be tilting on this axis that the corners are each going to follow their own little arcs as they turn in the animation. Yeah, I guess I don't really lose anything by fixing this corner here. Something along those lines so that way this arc continues that circle. I'm just going to go fix that real quick. Let's see how successful that was. I'm just sort of imagining these. Okay, great. So now I do have to go back and take these new versions of these keyframes and copy paste them over to all of their other respective keyframe locations. I'm just gonna go knock that out real quick. And I expect to have to do the same when I start getting to my left hand side. So remember those arcs? Right here is where the next quarter is gonna be. And now all I have to do is connect those lines. Now see, this one's really nice up here because I have these really clear points, these really clear corners to work with. This is an atrocity. I haven't given myself anything clear to work with. And I know this is a keyframe I'm adjusting, so I'm just gonna have to re remember to do that corner. I'm trying to make habits, man. I'm trying to make some good habits. So if I had thought ahead properly, all of my keyframes, I would have copied the frame and not the vector within the frame. If I copy the frame and make an edit to one, it makes an edit to all of them and I wouldn't have to keep going back and forth and copying all the vectors and putting all of them into their respective frames again. I'm gonna keep going with what I have now because I've already got a system for this project, but that's something for future projects. Nice. So now with the onion skins, we can see that it's slowly pushing speed. And now it has to slow down the other side. And yeah, now I'm just eyeballing where those corners are. You can tell that we've already run into a problem here because the right side of the brick has already met up with itself, but the top side of the brick still has distance to travel. 
I think with experience, I'll just get better at that. All right, let's see how that looks. I also learned that I can come down here and choose my stopping frame. And it puts my stopper there so I can get it. Beautiful. Starts slow, picks up speed, and slows at the end. It's subtle, but when we zoom out, have this happen multiple times with all of the other arts, it'll be much more noticeable and easier to appreciate. Whew, all that prep really knocks the wind out of ya. So next episode, we'll finish the teetering, and then things get explodey. So subscribe to stay tuned. And of course, today's honorable mention has got to go to the part-time professor for her clutch lesson on keyboard shortcuts. Check out her channel here.